Well, good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see your smiling faces here. Yes. Except the one back there in the very back that's snoring. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking with that one. <laughs> we are here today to worship Almighty Yahweh. Amen. He is El Shaddai, the Most High God. Yes. Whoa. It feels like a rest day to me. Didn't God, that one. doesn't God command us to rest today? Yes, but well, let's was, just go obey the command. <laughs> well, he also said on that on to, uh, with that is that we're to convocate and to study the the scriptures together. Well, that is what part of the command, isn't it? Yes, it means to rest from your ordinary work. Mm -hmm. Well, we are here today, uh, shifting gears, mm -hmm. getting out of our groove into God's groove. Amen. And um, I, I feel like I've got a, a teaching from the Lord this morning. We'll see how it goes. Hallelujah. <coughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Father, we come together today to worship you, to honor you, study your word, and to be a part of your family. Yes. Help us to be fully a part of your family. Yes. Help us to be able to enter into the covenant of work that you have for us and that we'll be able to serve you and your kingdom in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm hungry, Lord. I'm hungry, Lord. I'm asking you to feed me. I'm asking you to feed me. And give me living water. And give me living water. So I'll have plenty to give to others. So I have plenty to give to others. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated if you're able, if you don't have a job to do or whatever. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Well, I wanted to talk to you this morning about paradise. The word paradise itself conjures up some kind of a feeling. What does it conjure up to you? Peace. Perfection. Perfection. <coughs> Yes, beauty. I always think of the beach. Mm -hmm. So what happens if we try to achieve the perfection as portrayed to us by the Bible, but it doesn't work? Have you ever run into that problem? Are y'all asleep this morning? <laughs> <coughs> Oftentimes we try to p achieve the idealistic views yeah. that are portrayed to us in the Bible. God knows, and you know, and I know, that we are not perfect beings. Right. But we're striving for perfection. I've had over the years many people have come to me and said, Rabbi, I've messed up. What do I do? You know? Uh, I was trying so hard to be righteous and then boom, I fall on my face. Well, that's just the way life is. Chaye, life, starts with the letter chet, which is sin. <clears throat> That's a predominant factor in our lives, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Reminds me of what Yeshua said, and I think it was Job who said it too. I think Job was the earliest recording of it. He says that I was conceived in sin. Mm. In sin, my mother and father conceived me. 
And so we have, um, we have a battle with the flesh. And Rav Shaul wrote about it. He said, the things that I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. And the things that I should do, I don't do. <laughs> so who's going to save me from this, this uh, tomb of, fleshly tomb of death that we live in? So what do you do when you mess up? What's the Bible tell us to do? We keep striving. Hmm? But we keep striving. Let's go to John chapter first John chapter one. You're not supposed to give up. Chapter one? <clears throat> and this is the message, starting in verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him, none. If we claim to have fellowship with him while we are walking in the darkness, we are lying and not living out the truth. But if we are walking in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of his son, Yeshua, purifies us from a few sins. Yahweh does not, I mean, the rabbi does not what it says. What's it say? Purifies us from how much of our sins? All. All sin. If we claim not to have sin... We are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we acknowledge our sins, then since he is trustworthy and just, he will forgive them and purify us from all wrongdoing. If we claim we have not been sinning, we are making him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So these things are a little uh, controversial and sometimes not really easy understood. I'm going to go to the uh, complete, I mean, to the uh, New King James Version. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. If we confess, Everybody say confess. confess. What is confession? We are the, we're speaking out the truth to um, God in, uh, in uh, what we have done wrong. Let's say you got this beautiful, very expensive Bible that you bought and you cherish it. Mm -hmm. And I think it is absolutely gorgeous. A knockout. And I say, can I um, see your Bible? And you, your first inclination is because it costs so much. You did, first inclination is to say, uh, I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, why is that? Well, because we are creatures of faults. Everybody has faults, mm -hmm. yes. and you know that you are probably at times a little less careful than you should be. Mm -hmm. And here comes somebody else that you're not, you're not in their shoes, so you can't dictate how they're going to treat your very expensive Bible. Right. And so you just got this gut feeling inside that if I loan him that Bible, is not going to come back yeah. the same. <laughs> There'll be a page ripped or something in it, you know. <laughs> um, one day when we were in Oklahoma City, 
at a conference. I had loaned the conference my Taurus scroll. The big one? The big one. Really? And that thing is very expensive. Yes. <coughs> very. And you can buy a used one if you shop around and are blessed in your search. <laughs> you can probably buy a used one for two or three thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. Uh-huh. Yes. You can buy a new one for anywhere upwards of fifteen thousand dollars. Why does it cost so much? Well, first of all, it's handwritten. Yep. The entire thing is handwritten. And in order to get one that's really perfect, it takes a lot of money because the scribe has to be extremely careful as he goes to not make mistakes. Right. So I brought this Torah scroll up to this conference. And... The first thing they did was throw it on the floor under a table. Oy, oy, oy. Oy, oy, oy. Ah. <laughs> I ripped my soul already. God. Not only is it, a, you know, you wouldn't treat a, an expensive English Bible that way. <laughs> so. I went up to the uh, guy that was in charge of everything up there. Yeah. And I said, I see a terrible problem right now. Do you see it? He looked around and, no, I don't see a problem. Look at the Torah. Mm -hmm. Where is it? On the floor, under that table. Is that where it belongs? If you had a $3,000 Bible in English and somebody threw it on the floor under a table, how would you feel about it? It costs you a lot of bucks, mm -hmm. many hours of labor. Not to count the hours of labor went into writing the thing. Wow. But what's the biggest problem with throwing it under the table? It's disrespectful. I'm sorry? That was disrespectful. Disrespectful is also very likely to damage the Torah. Mm -hmm. So it's God's word, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. So even if it's a dollar ninety-five Bible, you wouldn't want to throw it under the table. Yep. So we have this uh, standards that are kind of uh, sloppy, haphazard, not well thought out. I felt like taking my my Torah home with me right then, right there, and not even let them use it if that's the way it's treated. Mm -hmm. But see, life is not perfect. I have this truck that we bought. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway... I loaned it to somebody, and they pulled into Sonic, and we're too close to the sign, and it scratched the front part of my front bumper. I could not believe that. If we're that way with a vehicle, which is just a physical thing, then what are we like with God's thing? When he says Shemar HaTorah, what does that mean? What is Shomer? To hear and do. To, to guard. And to guard it, yeah. And protect it. And to make certain that you know it and are obeying it. 
Yes. But we're too sloppy. So if we, let's say I borrowed uh, Olivia's car and I pulled in too close to a sign and scratched it. Do I have enough regard for her and her possessions to tell her I scratched your vehicle I'm sorry. I made an error in judgment and I was too close to the sign. And what can I do? And what can I do, what can I do to make it up to you? you? And you say, well, you can take it to the shop and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Put it back in the condition it was in when you borrowed it. What does the Bible tell us to do if we borrow something from someone and we end up damaging it? You need to replace it or, or you know, fix it or replace it. It either needs to be repaired mm -hmm. or it needs to be replaced with a better one. Yep, a better one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. But you're a believer, so you have to live with it. <laughs> long, no. long <laughs> suffering. <laughs> yeah, really, like what? Like because I'm a believer, you have a license to just destroy just what I no have. Way. Is that it? My property? I don't think so. Nope. That's not what it's in the Bible. No, it isn't. No. I've had Christians tell me all the time that the Torah is just too rigid. I mean, they, they do demands that we um, reciprocate value for value if we damage something that belongs to our neighbor. Mm -hmm. well, I don't think that's right. Well, yes, it is right. Mm -hmm. So... We say we have no sin. Well, that was a sin against Olivia if I scratched her vehicle. Mm -hmm. So I have to take care of that. Somehow I've got to see it right. So if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the truth isn't in us. If we confess our sin, so that's the first thing that we're supposed to do when we yeah. sin, mm -hmm. is to confess our sins. Yeah. Olivia, I'm so sorry I damaged your car. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. That didn't mean I was supposed to get off scot-free. Right, right. <laughs> that didn't mean I get to forget it, mm -hmm. that I scratched your car. Yeah, or that I'm supposed to forget it. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> if we confess our sins, he, that would be Yeshua, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins Amen. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not only does he forgive, but he makes it like new all over again. So what is our responsibility in this? Our responsibility is to do our part to make sure that we are making it up to our neighbor for who we have offended. Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is confess our sins. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please. Is that what it means? To confess our sins? Well, that's part of it. I didn't mean to do that. Did you mean not to? 
That's the question. (laughs) (laughs) But Christianity has bred a bunch of people who call themselves believers that don't believe in doing what the Bible says. Exactly. Yep. We see that every day. Christians in particular, when they're dealing with other Christians, are very slack in it, trying to repair problems that they've created. Mm-hmm. I'll try there. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from people outside the congregation say, I never want to do business with a Christian again. Yeah. Why? Because they think you can ju- they can just cheat you and do whatever they want to, and they're not responsible. He told me about a guy that bought some tires off of him. He didn't make but half the payments and then quit. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Mm -hmm. And his word is not in us. So here, Messiah, what has he done? Does he have an agreement with us? If you are a believer, you have an agreement full of empty words. Did you know you make an agreement with the Messiah not to sin again when you take his blood sacrifice on yourself? That's right. It's an understood contract. Yes. And if you go out and sin again, once you have tasted the heavenly gift and been set free of those things, let's see what it says in... uh, Hebrews chapter 8. I think it's a little before that. forget the exact chapter here but it it says that if you have tasted the heavenly gift and and the gift that was given to us is, is salvation and then you go and sin again willfully to restore you to repentance there isn't a sacrifice that will cover that and the implication is not even sacrifice will cover you for that. Mm. Just try to find that real quick. I think it's important to show you it in the Bible. I don't know what I'll do. I can find it quicker this way. Uh, (laughs) Brain's not working. Not working well enough to, to make that work. I can't remember the key words. Um, But to restore them again, I can't remember how it's worded. I know it's in Hebrews, unless I got the wrong chapter name, (laughs) wrong book name. But anyway, 
Um, There it is, chapter 6. For when people have once been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift, become sharers in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and tasted the goodness of God's word and the powers of Olam Haba, the age to come, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them so that they, re they turn from their sin as long as for themselves they keep exec executing the Son of God on the execution pole all over again and keep holding him up to public content. I want to get that back in the uh, regular King James. just worded more in your face. <laughs> it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they have crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So that's a that's a threat that Christians ought to pay attention to. Everybody should pay attention to that. But the problem is that Christians are not trained responsibility in their faith. Um I've heard it called sloppy agape. <laughs> um, it's terrible. For the earth which drinks in the rain it, that often comes up on it and herbs and bears herbs and useful for those who by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God but it if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Hmm. So when we fail to reach the mark of perfection that we know we're supposed to be striving for, and we take it lightly and we don't even apologize to God for crying out loud let alone your family or or your friends maybe they won't notice if I don't say anything <laughs> don't you count on it What does Messiah say? He says, if you fend your brother and then you bring your gift to the altar, he says, just walk away from it and go fix your relationship with your brother and then come back and offer your gift to God. Why? Because if you've got that kind of an attitude towards your brother, how is God going to be able to forgive you for your faults? You can't. You got to be forgiven first by your earthly brothers. And that's what Judaism teaches. That's a keynote teaching from Judaism. And it says, if you've offended someone during the days of Elul, you do whatever it takes to make amends to you between you and your brother. And then God will forgive you. 
but not unless you have done everything you can to try to fix the problem. And one time God spoke to me. I had a gift I wanted to give to God, a financial gift. And God spoke to me and he says, you have a problem between you and this other person. And I want you to go fix it first. And after you fix it, then we'll talk about receiving your gift. So I called this guy up. And I knew that he had something against me that I didn't know what it was. And so I said, I called him up and said, uh, I'd like to get together, have a cup of coffee or something, and, and talk. He said, okay. So I said, how about uh, Wednesday morning, and we'll go to the coffee shop and have coffee. He says, all right. And then I called him back the day before to confirm so that I'd make sure he remembered that we had an appointment. And uh, he said, what's this about anyway? I said, well, I just, the Bible says to get to know those who labor among you. And I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Well, I don't want to do that. What? <laughs> That's a direct New Testament command. And this guy was a minister. And I said, uh, well, it won't take long. And it's just, just to try to get closer to the Word of God and to the Messiah. I don't care. I don't want, I don't want to get to know you. I said, why? What have I done to you? Nothing. You haven't done anything to me. Well, it seems I have, or you wouldn't feel that way about it. What is there so bad about me that you can't stand me? He says, I don't want to discuss it. I'm not going to discuss it, and that's it. And he hung up the phone on me. Man, that hurt. I said, Lord, I tried to fix it. He says, I saw you. <laughs> I said, and I wanted to fix it. He says, I know you did. So what do I do now? He says, give your offering. I'll receive it now. So I gave my offering to the Lord, and he did what I was sowing the seed for, and it worked, and it was good. I pray that God shows me if I'm in that kind of a situation where I just flat won't cooperate with someone. That's terrible. It was about, I don't know, a few months later. And I, I was invited to come to a ministerial uh, luncheon. And I got there, and this minister was there. And he got up in front of the whole group, and he says, I don't know for sure what's happened but I have lost the anointing to minister. So I'm resigning from my pulpit. I didn't ask for that. I didn't, I wasn't upset with him, but God was. And he had a clear opportunity to be able to make things uh, right and make amends. And he chose not to he chose not to how can god keep him there as a minister of the light under that circumstance 
And I believe that there are literally thousands of ministers out there that are in the same boat. This is a warning for those of you who are in that condition. If you've got something against someone, fix it. Because God wants you to. That's why. But I know you don't like those people that have, have, uh, you have a fault with. But try to fix it. You've got to try to fix it or God won't hear your prayers. Once you find out you've messed up, you're supposed to confess it. Not to God, to the individual that you're finding fault with. You're supposed to go to your brother first and try to make amends. Well, I can't afford to do that. Well, you better find some way to do it. Because if you don't, it's going to bite you. And in the end, the outcome won't be too pretty. You find yourself resigning from your pulpit if you're a minister. Because you're not doing what God commanded you to do. So anyway, <sighs> it's an imperfect life. And sometimes things happen that throw us into a bind. And it's still our responsibility to do the best that we can do to make it right. There's a, there's a law in the Torah called uh, restoration. And you're supposed to restore the things that you've done to your neighbor, your friends. Uh, you're supposed to do it to the best of your ability. What can I say? There's nothing left to say. Growing up time is here. It's time for you and I to get off of our little backsides and make things right with people. Anybody got any comments from the Hooray Gallery or anything like that? <laughs> Nobody? Well, what, it's partly, I guess, you've answered my question already, but if this person continues to offend you and ca causing a, you know, a, a burdensome towards you, then what do you do then? And you still try to make amends with them, but... Okay, what you do... But they don't it want depends to. on which foot the shoe's on, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> if you are um, the recipient of bad things from someone and it keeps happening, the Bible instructs us to confront them mm -hmm. with their error. You're supposed to confront them. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> well, you better. The Bible instructs us to do it, and that's a New Testament commandment. Mm -hmm. It's clearly spelled out in the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, that you are to co confront those who are offending you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, how will they know to quit? They may not even know what they're doing. But even after so many times, they still don't seem to get it or try to si find some way to go in a roundabout way about it. So what did the Messiah say? How many times are you supposed to uh, forgive the faults of another if they ask you to? Forgive them. Well, no, you just keep, just keep, keep, forgiving. keep forgiving. You just keep on forgive, forgiving yeah. as long as they ask you to forgive you. But they must ask you to forgive them. Yeah. Right. And that's the part that causes them to realize what they've done. 
And if you don't give them the opportunity to know what they've done, uh -huh. then you haven't done your part. Right. And I've heard this mistaught so many times, it makes me want to throw up. <laughs> yeah. Because God's rules are merciful and kind and gentle. Are you near a mic? No, he's not. You're not. You need to be in a mic. Otherwise, it's pulled off and it's just good. Well, you can get the orange one. Oh. Oh, you can get the pink one. Mm -hmm. And God will judge upon their heart for however they uh, ask this forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because I've met people who really are not really asking for forgiveness. They just want to get mm -hmm. away from uh, making any real restitution. When they say forgive, in their mind, they mean totally absolve it. Yeah, and just forget about it. So that you don't, they don't owe you nothing anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what they want when they say forgive. That's Please forgive me. <laughs> That's not going to work. No. Go ahead, Lou. Orange mic. Orange mic. It's a spare mic. Number one. Spare. Oh, sorry. Uh, anyway, I was thinking about the scripture. Uh, uh, if you have a problem with your brother and you, you're supposed to go to him, and if he accepts you, you've gained a brother. If he doesn't, then take a witness. And if it still does not accept what you uh making peace, you take it before the congregation. Mm -hmm. So that way, the person that that uh, attempted would be totally clear conscious, but the person who refuses was not until they make agreement to make amends. That's in Matthew. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to go down to, um, starting in verse 8 is what's called, what is improperly called the uh, the Messiah's, prayer or our father. yeah our father who uh, who knows the things you okay our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Look at verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's the mandate right there. The fact is, a lot of people are religious so that they will appear religious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is so clear. Yeah. And so, so does that mean all these people that are promoting sort of a hatred and anger towards our president all owe him... Apology. Apologies, <laughs> or that's, oh, that's going to come back on them severely. Mm -hmm. They need to forgive him for whatever he might have done against them, too. Well, so far, he hasn't done anything <laughs> but, but try to do right by this nation. All they want to do is throw mud on him. 
Yeah, that it doesn't matter what he says or does. They're just promoting hatred. Mm -hmm. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And there are scriptures that tell us that if we are offended by someone, a brother, we must confront them with what they did wrong and give them an opportunity to make amends. And if we don't let them know what they did wrong, then we're as guilty as they are. In verse 16, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. Right. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward already. They don't need to wait for the Lord to give them the reward because they already look like they're fasting. <laughs> You're so righteous. You're fasting all the time. Oh, my Lord, how can you do that, you know? They have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head with... Uh, excuse me. Anoint your head with oil. Wash your face mm -hmm. so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And then he goes on talking about um, don't lay up treasures in earth where uh, moth or rust destroys, thieves break in and steal. But for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there's, there's a lot to this. The whole Bible was given to us as a guide. And you can't just close your eyes to the parts that you don't like. Mm -hmm. That's called smorgasbord religion, and that doesn't work. <laughs> God gives us a good balanced diet of food spiritually to take to give us spiritual health. Mm -hmm. And if we don't take advantage of the food that he gives us, then we are hurting ourselves, not somebody else. It's just like the Christian who says they're following God, but then you're they, you see them eating some vile, some really vile stuff, <laughs> and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm disgusted. <laughs> now, I've seen so many Christians have the uh, a big log in their eye, and they type, try to want to get the splinter out of yours, yeah, a exactly, little speck exactly. of dust. And there's that phrase, "Practice what you preach." Yeah, but they're not. Uh, right yeah. okay well that's basically what god gave me for today Meh. and uh, hopefully we can all grow and learn by it and uh, i pray that you will be able to see the little speck of dust that's in your own eye mm -hmm. or try to get it out you don't have any business trying to once you get that out of there then you can see your brother's little speck in his yes. eye then you have the right to, you know. Did you ever get a speck of dust in your eye? Yeah. Hurts like the devil, doesn't it? Yep. Or you scratch your eye. Ooh, that hurts even more. Um, You'll do just about anything you can do on earth to try to get that out of there, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Or even an eyelash that's stuck in there. Mm hmm Okay, well, that's about it for this class this morning then. So we will uh, dismiss for... A uh, little short break here and then go right into our morning service.